Good morning. Happy New Year and uh, welcome to the January meeting of Division One. My name is Tom Pearson. I've given a couple clinics for you folks. I'm standing in for Dick today. Uh, he's at, at home and probably watching and uh, he's recovering from uh, knee replacement surgery and which went fine and so he's uh, on the mend in that regard. I hear it buzzing in the background. So anyway, uh, we have an interesting meeting for you today. We have a clinic by Jim Odom, more of a round table kind of thing, talking about 3D printing. And uh, we have a raffle. Uh, we've got another couple of tickets for the uh, Durango and Silverton narrow gauge thing that we'll be doing. Those will be $5 a piece or six for 25, kind of like what we did last year about this time. And so with that, I'd like to ask Dick Crumpton, our General Dick, David, David Crumpton, God, why don't you come up and give us a word of wisdom about okay, the club? I don't want to have a wisdom I have, but how many of you are the first time at the Texas club? Mike, this is Mike. Microphone. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay, how many of you are here for the first time to the Texas Western? Okay, everybody's a veteran. Welcome to the Texas Western Model Railroad Club. Uh, Jay Waters, uh, Jay, raise your hand. If you see Jay Waters right there, he is our Chief Administrative Officer. Jay, do we have any memberships available? <laughs> we have a few left. Okay, so don't don't wait. Rush to the, rush to Jay after the meeting, and he'll get you started if you'd like to look at uh, becoming a member of our club. Before you get out of here today, take a time, take a little bit of time to walk around the layout and see the changes, the improvements, the things that are going on. We try to work on it every week. Of course, the holidays kind of slowed us down a little bit, but we're trying to make progress every week. Uh, not related to the club, uh, Daryl Cowles, would you give us a report on Mike Mackey, please? And, and I'm picking on Daryl because Daryl has been in contact with Mike and also PJ over the last couple of days. If you haven't heard, Daryl's gonna fill you in. Thank you. Uh, yeah, Mike, who, uh, test. Uh, Mike had uh, a heart attack actually uh, a couple of days ago and um, had to go in, he's at uh, uh, Medical City Alliance. He had to have uh, three stents put in and this was in the Widowmaker vein, the uh, LAD vein that they call it. This was the Widowmaker, so it was, uh, it was a pretty good deal. It was uh, getting really closed up. So they put three stents in. I spoke with him after that, and he was in pretty good spirits, and then they found a pulmonary embolism. So he's now in ICU watching that uh, that's in there. And, uh, but he's uh, still, still there, gonna be there for a couple more days, I'm sure, and then, uh, uh, in a week or two, they're going to have a couple of more stents to put in, but those are not as urgent as the other ones were. So uh, good wishes toward Mike. Hopefully he gets better uh, very quickly and is uh, up and running again. Thank you, Daryl. <coughs> just to add to the clarification, the LAD is a major coronary artery on the left-hand side of the heart. And I know this because that's the heart attack my wife had in 2020. We found out when she was going through that heart attack that if you have that heart attack outside of a hospital setting, you've got a 12% chance of survival. That's why they call it the Widowmaker. So uh, thoughts and prayers for Mike. Good. Thank you, David. <laughs> okay, some of the other things that we're going to have happen right after the meeting today. Uh, we're going to have a work session for the layout that's going to be uh, raffled off at uh, next week's Plano train show. And so we're going to be doing some track lading and wiring and whatever to try and get that ready to go over there. So with that in mind, um, who would like to talk about the Plano train show and volunteers? There you are. Uh, she lost that loving feeling in it, boys. Um, <laughs> <laughs> as usual, with the show's coming up. Um, I've had a few people contact me about um, volunteers. I've, uh, Division three, I'm, I'm, I haven't heard really much. I'm sure we're covered. 
for the most part, but we have a, uh, it's always tough every time this, we have a show. We've had a, a few people showing up, but we need more people from Division One to show up and help as far as working, running the booth, working on the uh, modular layout, uh, any other help we can get. Uh, as of right now, I think we got everything covered, but uh, uh, we got we got some help setting the booth up on Friday. We'll be there about between noon and one. We'll get all that set up and get the uh, module set up. Other than that, that's all we've all got. Okay, thank you, Russell. Um, I'd also like to welcome the people that are joining us on Zoom this morning. Uh, we did have a little technical glitch in that the first Zoom email was sent out. Apparently, didn't have the correct sign-in log and so unless those, some of these folks got up early and read their emails and found the new number we may have a smaller than normal uh group of people participating via zoom this morning so which, they are, which, is, the case. which is the case okay so we have a quiet time we, it means the commercial interruptions will be shorter today on the YouTube channel later. okay all right so um dave asked about uh any visitors and whatever do we not really have any new visitors this morning then or it's everybody's been here before and whatever so okay well thank you for coming i'm sure glad the meeting is today rather than tomorrow morning it would be really refreshing to have gotten up and started our cars and tried to get here so okay um let's see what do you want to do and you know, we talked about the plane train show we've got the lsr convention coming up in february uh the 15th through the 17th um, it's going to be uh, down in Houston, and it's going to be close to the uh, Greater Houston Train Show facility. And in fact, uh, the registration for the convention will also include uh, early access to the train show on Saturday. So uh, if you haven't done that, that's an interesting venue and show, assuming the same place. I, I won't tell you how many years ago I gave a clinic down there, but it's been a while. I, I didn't have gray here. So, um, yes, sir, Mr. Joe. Come up and talk in the mic, please. Questions? Yes, sir. Does anyone want to share a ride going down there or need a ride? Okay. okay. All right. Well, not everybody's here this morning. And so um, you might post that on the, well, the chat group, the IO group thing. You might say, hey, I'm looking for a thing. Yes, sir. Yeah. <laughs> no, tell you right. Sorry about that. Okay. okay well, then. Can I take the debt? Do you want to go? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now there will be a list of people waiting to sign up. All right. <laughs> All right, Dwayne, are you ready to talk about awards and the AP program? Sure. Come on down. Uh, looking across the room, I don't think we've got anybody here that we need to have here, uh, but we'll run through it just in case and see. I've uh, been trying to give these to Chris Atkins now for a couple of months, but uh, 
I'll probably have to mail those to him. He's uh, Chris has earned chief dispatcher, volunteer, and author. And I'm wow. pretty sure he already has official. He should have it if he doesn't, but I'm yeah. pretty sure we talked him into getting the paperwork together for that one. Good so him. he's at least halfway home now. Um, so there's, uh, in fact, interior chief dispatcher. Yeah, he's probably got a couple of other ones sitting there that are either just about done or done. So mm -hmm. uh, hopefully we'll get some more out of him. Mike Armstrong with us this morning? Uh, no. No, I don't um, see him. Mike's got his scenery okay. that uh, he picked up after we went by for his open house mm -hmm. after the meeting a few yeah. months back. And uh, we went ahead and just judged his scenery while we were there. Okay. So uh, I will get these in the mail to these guys and that way they can get them up on their wall. Um, we've got, uh, I don't think I've got any paperwork from anybody for this month. So we've got a few more days left. My deadline's the 19th. So if you've got any AP related things you want to get to me, you've got a few more days left. And then I have to have it turned into national by the 20th. Uh, we've got some submissions from the Austin area and I've got one from, I think from Houston. Uh, okay. Another thing to note too, we have a gentleman down in Mexico City or about an hour north of Mexico City. Uh, they don't even have enough model railroaders down there to have their own regions. So they've, uh, they've asked us if we could help kind of shepherd his work through the AP program. We've been helping him out for a number of years now. But uh, uh, Senor Ezekiel Duran uh, finished up a uh, certificate. We'll be getting that. I've got that at the house. Came in yesterday, so I'll be uh, sending that off down to Mexico. That'll be his second, cer his second certificate. Uh, he's got a layout that is rather large, and it's uh, built on a steel bench work and welded together. You could, okay. we, we joke about you could park a truck on it. His, you could literally park a truck on it. Um, he's pretty much primed for scenery, structures. Um, I want to say he's got two or three more, but we've got him mapped out on a plan to get him out through the rest of his to get his uh, MMR, which will make him the first and only Master Model Railroader in Mexico. So that's cool. Uh, so that ought to work out real well. Um, that's all I've got as far as the AP goes. Okay. So. You want to do? Uh, we're going to do show and tell. You want to start with that? You got a thing uh, for I've, us today? I've got one real, real small one for show okay. and tell. Um, my wife has some really weird uh, allergy issues and a lot of it around dietary things, and she has found that there's this custard that they sell at Walmart that comes in a little glass dish in the refrigerated section. Okay. Not that, the, not that I'm recommending the custard at all, but these little glass dishes are the bomb. Um, they're only about an inch tall or a little over an inch tall, but they're really wide. And I found that these are great for doing decal work. You can get enough water in it that you can get even a big decal in it, especially for HO. And old scale, yeah, the old scalers might be, uh, might be crowding things a bit still, but you do, you're not fishing down into the bottom of something trying to find your decal if it sinks to the bottom kind of thing. Uh, I really, really like these for that purpose. I had brought a couple with me to hand out to a couple of the guys. But uh, back in the refrigerated section at Walmart, it's it's some sort of custard. But anyway, okay. these these are really, really slick. Very good. All right. Um, we have another structure up here. I'm guessing someone would like to come up and tell us about that for show and tell. Well, surprise, surprise. Mr. Russell, <laughs> come on down. <laughs> well, I appreciate that. Uh, okay. Get up here. Uh, talked to Wayne earlier to make sure this classified as a scratch build, and it does. Um, last train show, I bought a couple of uh, fine scale miniature kits. The reason I buy them is for the detail parts and the siding. So that's what this is right here. The uh, only thing I used on this out of the kit was just the siding because it's kind of a unique siding. Everything else was scratch built off. All these little side buildings are always cardboard. I make everything out of, out of birch and, and balsa and redo everything. Um, if you notice how the staining is on the siding, I'll try to do technique on this. I stain the wood before I paint it. And I come back with an airbrush and lightly coat it. So I kind of get the grain of the wood and I get some weathering depth into it. Looks better when you look at closer. Looks pretty good that way. Um, the the uh, I love George Sinolius' layout. And I love his his kits and everything he does. Um, 
Unfortunately, he doesn't have this one on his layout. I look, but um, I did all the dock deck. I did the uh, telegraph wires. Got them wired in. It is lit up on the inside. I don't have power to it right now. Another thing cool I found uh, the shades you're seeing in the windows. I went to um, Jerry's Artorama, and he's got this hand laid paper that you can buy. These huge sheets are like seven dollars. But when you shine the light to it, it looks like an old parchment shade. You see when you pull them down, so it's got a really unique look to it. It doesn't look like a piece of crepe paper. It looks like kind of like an old shade. But um, as you can see, I try to create the scene. There's a lot of activity going on here. Um, one of my favorite parts is actually the military guys getting their pictures taken before they go off to duty. And then I've got the guy standing. Uh, Right here is a fruit stand, and uh, that's part of the detail part as well, but you got to paint all the fruit and all that stuff. And on the back side, as well, I get the baggage coming in, baggage getting checked in, all the baggage cart scales and all that, and then people coming into the back, and of course somebody kissing goodbye in the back. Um, we got the fire barrels on top of it. I used uh, Bar Mills's shingles, kind of like those. They're, pretty, they're easier to put on. And I've got one building I've individually cut every shingle, and I needed Prozac after I finished that. <laughs> uh, and uh, all the ridges and stuff are copper. Well, I take um, have this real thin sheet gauge copper. And I cut it to fit and score it. And I take it to the stove and I anneal it and get the dark age color on top of it and glue it down and use that for a ridge. Um, other than that, that's pretty much it. I mean, it's, it was fun building. I've got about 200 hours in this one. Refresh, and, uh, uh, refresh my memory on how you do the lighting. Are you an LED person or a light yeah, person? I've got several LEDs placed okay. in there, but they're different temperatures Temperature and color. colors. Okay. So you, some are more yellow, some are more white. And also inside there's some division pieces, of like, uh, so it kind of splits the light out yep. so you don't have a, where it looks like there's just one great big bowl All in right. there. Um, the uh, very front of it, where the uh, station master would be in here, mm -hmm. that light's mounted up at, a, at an odd angle. And I also take a piece of uh, foil and put it inside there so I get some reflection Kind of a weird look. It's a different look. It looks, okay. I don't know how to explain it to you. Just, you. You see a different kind of light in the front okay. of it. Um, but all in all, there's six lights in the whole thing. Okay. Very good, sir. So that's pretty much it. Thank you very I much. I hope I will take this one to the LSR convention and see how it does. Okay. It's impressive. All right. Did it, was my imagination or has, was Mike Mackey watching from down in the corner? Looked like he was signed on a minute ago. But anyway, that's oh, that's us. We're Mike Mackey. Oh, okay. Fair enough. All right, Eric, I understand you have something for us today. Yeah, you've already seen these because you've got, but um, and at the Plano train show, I'll be showing more of these. Um, I'm going to use the same little camera if you can focus in or if I'm too close, let me know. Um, producing what will be light boxes. They'll have an LED light in the back of them. And I have 150 road names. So if you have a road name that's out there, fallen flag or whatever, I probably have it. And I'll have these, uh, I don't know, 20 or 30 different ones showing available at the Plano train show. And so uh, David has graciously allowed me a little end of their table to actually set them up and so if you're looking for some sort of light box they have an LED strip that runs throughout the inside so it's lit with a remote control and uh, I'm thinking about even doing one for your Texas <coughs> Western group I've got your logo and ready to go so if, if you've got LEDs inside of there Eric mm -hmm. do you have uh, a connection out the back. It's out to where, a 110. Where it, so it's, it's configured for 110? Yeah. So you've got a little 
little voltage yeah. drop inside. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Cool. It's got an LED and, and it's also got a remote control. The, the remote control allows you to set um, the white intensity from like 2700K up to 6500K. So you can cool. go real bright white or a very dim. And Tom's got one for the Rock Island. Mm -hmm. that, and so if y'all want to come see, it has a very special texture on the top that uh, kind of makes it blend in. So looks good. Very good. Thank you. Dwayne, do we want to interrupt? I see our uh, man of the hour has arrived. And so, uh, Chris, why don't you uh, stand up and come up here, and we've got a quick presentation for you. Ladies and gentlemen, Chris Atkins, representing Idaho today. So as we mentioned a little earlier, Chris oh. is our author, good volunteer, oh, nice, and chief dispatcher. Very nice, thank you. Yeah. Congratulations. Congratulations. Hey, way to go, Chris. Chris, sir. Somebody going to take a picture? Yeah. yeah. So you've already got all, you got official, right? Yeah. So this is four now. It's four now. So no what are we uh, what are we working on for the other three? Uh, one of the engineering ones. Uh, electric, elect electric. Civil, electrical, or you've got dispatchers, so you're out, you've got engineering and you've got the service of the hobby. You're going to need something, either yeah. motive power or cars. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So and a scenery TV. structures or yeah. prototype. So I'm thinking probably civil engineering, mm -hmm. cars. Let me take a picture. Structures probably. Yeah. Anyway. Cool. Yeah, Excellent. Have a word, yes. You bet. Okay, thank you. Anybody else with uh, show and tell? All right, come on up. Oh, I have a tell, not a show. Okay. Ready, 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 I guess. Oh, oh, you got to walk. I'm sorry. We have I have to... a loud voice. <laughs> it doesn't carry over the internet. <laughs> uh, this has been a red letter week for me. I finally have a locomotive running through Gerber Yard. I finished wiring 63 switches, uh, which is a uh, laying track goes much faster than the wiring, especially since the frogs are all live frogs uh, also. So it's the first time since 2018 that I've had a locomotive running. Uh, so it's good to have this new layout up. And I looked at my website and I hadn't posted anything since October, I think 25th. People probably thought I died or something. It just took a long time. I went back to California and I have to go back out to California next week. But uh, I'm uh, anyway making progress. If you look at Southern Pacific uh, layout.com you can kind of see where I'm at now but putting fascia up this afternoon when I get home so okay. quick update very good thank you one more what is tool kit and everything yeah that was the point uh, anybody here do uh, styrofoam scenery where you make your mountains and stuff like yeah, that sorry. yeah I uh, one of the things I always disliked about uh, styrofoam scenery was uh, the fact that you either had to have a knife or you had to have a hot knife with a long extension cord. I happened to be shopping with my daughter over in the Mansfield area, and I went into a Home Depot and saw a box that looked like this. But inside that box was one of, a, a tool that I thought was Come on, take out this stuff, it's going to fall out. Um, that looks, well, like this. It's a hot knife, battery operated. So I don't have to have uh, the long, not, the, the battery, like this. Uh, you know, fits in the handle. And I can put on the knife blade, there's a shorter one, and also the, no, the traditional wire one that we normally see. Now, I pay about $100 for a knife, uh, but you'll, uh, for most of the stuff, because of the power supply and stuff that has to come with it to, in order to power, because uh, the hot knives don't have just a 110 and you hook it up to the wall. You have a, uh, you know, a particular voltage, like I think it's like 18 volts, but they run through it to heat the, the, the wire and stuff. Now, my uh, my deal was is that uh, I enjoyed I enjoyed doing it, but this would make my life a whole lot easier when I can pick up stuff. 
because I can get up in, into the scenery. I'm work. Anybody known Char uh, Charles Goodrich? No. Yeah. Have you seen? He's got a, a, a room about this size here for his layout. And so you're having to actually crawl up in it. So to do the styrofoam without having that stupid cord that's going to be hitting things, <laughs> it was, was uh, you know, a good thing. But anyway, like I said, I'm always looking for uh, new tools and new opportunities. And this is at Home Depot. It's a, it's a Ryobi. Ryobi, yeah. Okay. And uh, like I said, it's battery operated. Now, I will tell you that having charged this battery the hard way, which is they do provide you with uh, a little tiny a USB cord. Oh, it's slow. They have a charger for uh, for the batteries that you can also get. I don't. I have not received it in the mail yet. I have ordered it, but I promise you that um, it's it's a whole lot faster. It's supposed to be a whole lot faster than what I tried at. When I did try it at the Home Depot. It is a lot faster charge than trying to <coughs> USB it. But you can always USB it. And, but uh, the battery life on it for, for me has been for about an hour, hour, hour and a half. So I have also ordered myself some, some more batteries. Yes, sir. Do they have any Milwaukee's there? Hot knives? I don't know. <laughs> I didn't look for it. Yeah, if, if, if they do, they'd probably break about the first 30 minutes you had it. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, anyway, I thought it was an, an interesting tool for uh, being able to work with styrofoam, because I do work with styrofoam, even on uh, making little scenery, uh, minuets kind of things, dioramas, uh, for, you know, I, I, the hot knife is easier, I don't have to drag, drag the cord around. So, FYI, it's, it's, uh, it's a new one, it's, uh, it was less than 100 bucks, and this was like during the Christmas holidays, when I saw it, so, it's, this is new for me too. Very good, thank you Jeff, great, mm -hmm. great idea, and great find. All right, anybody else for show and tell? or tips and tricks. If not, why don't we go ahead and take a break and uh, we'll come back and uh, we'll do our clinic thing. One other small piece of information, uh, there will not be a layout tour today. We frankly didn't have any volunteers. And uh, so we need to have uh, someone step up, you know, obviously behind the scenes to Mr. Brennan and company and uh, to, uh, to volunteers. So maybe we'll have one uh, next month. Okay, oh, yes, sir. Oh, okay. All right. Okay. And the other thing is the, the raffle. Um, we have the raffle tickets. So, uh, okay. The tick, the tickets are $5 a piece and, and, or six for 25. And, uh, I know some, I know somebody asked question online, whether you could buy them online somehow or other. I'm not aware that we can do that. So please avail yourself of some raffle tickets and we'll see if we can do that at the end of the day. I, if, I guess if we, since, the train's not going to be running for, you know, a month or two. If we don't have a lot of participation, we could always do a carryover and wait and raffle them next month when hopefully it'll be springtime and, you know, everybody will be here and signed on. So. They started May. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you. Let's take a 10-minute take a break, and then we'll come back. Thank you. Well, folks, I'd like to welcome you. I'm Jim Ogden. I'm actually doing kind of a backup um, uh, seminar today. Our little uh, um, we were supposed to have a different talk today, and I think the the uh, possibility of ice has everybody panicked. Now we've had some changes that are kind of going through with our uh, the way we kind of approach structures now, and I, and uh, we're going to talk about some of the new things that are happening. Now I'm not putting myself in front of you as being the great guru. On structure modeling, I mean, I've you know I've made uh, I'm actually to show you some of the big boo boos that I've done, and I'm not embarrassed to show you the things I've screwed up on in my life. And you know, I'm so innovative, I can always find something else to foul up on. Can I inter can I interrupt just for a second? Certainly. We've decided based on the participation to wait and hold the raffle drawing next month. Thank you. Okay. Um, if in fact you don't think you're going to be here, or there's a chance, you might want to make sure that Harold has the half of the ticket. That, that's got your name and whatever we you don't have won't have to be present to win because of the situation today so uh just fyi we're going to hold that over so thank you i'm sorry jim at the uh, yeah okay check out on the way out 
Okay, sorry, Jim. Thank you. Go ahead. Oh, I'm fine. Like I said, I appreciate y'all being here. You know, we'll try and get our normally scheduled presenter to talk a little bit later in the uh, uh, year here. But it's kind of like, you know, we always want to have our own layout. We want it to be kind of different. Now, I'm sitting over here drooling over Russell's depot here. And, and if you look what he's done here, he's done some kind of remarkable things with that kit. I love those, uh, those colors he painted at those end. Those were very much uh, very common on the Burlington with the, uh, the red and the, the, the green windows. So I'm kind of impressed and trying to keep from drooling on it. But when we build a layout, we always want to make it a little bit different than somebody else's, okay? Don't want to make it too different. We want to do with prototype practices, but we want to make things to make ours stand out just a little bit. Let's go to the next slide, please. Okay, plastic structures have pretty much been a staple of our hobby for years. I think we've all had these, okay? There's the Ravel Farmhouse. I've got a banker's box with one in it that uh, I assembled back when I was a kid. Of course, mine, I, forget, I think mine was an AHM. These things have been rebranded many, 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 many times. And, of course, here's the Ravel Small Town Station. I actually was on one of the forums on the Internet, found out that it's an actual, actual real structure. There were supposedly drawings in MR back in the 1950s, and I think Rob Corston actually built a model of it, and it was all kind of, and, uh, and Ravel, almost before the article was, uh, was printed, actually had uh, a plastic injection molded kit for it. Let's go to the next slide, please. Some cases, these kits take on a line for its own. This, of course, is the, uh, the uh, R. Lee station, which has been around forever. Uh, I actually had one that was the old AHM mini kits and uh, then wound up saying, I want to do something a little bit different. I, I used to see some of these stations in East Texas that were much, much, much longer than others, and it's fairly easy to splice these things together. And the Tyco kit did not mind being, being uh, uh, attached to a... AHM kit, and of course, you know, I, of course, diligently brush, brush painted it, and it looks like it was actually brush painted by a 12 year old. Next slide, please. So, somewhere in the banker's box is my own RLE station, and I did something kind of by accident. Of course, you got to understand in the mind of a kid, I'm wound up losing some of the parts out of it. So, I went down to Lou Cook's Hobby Shop in Shreveport and got some grant line windows, and they looked so good I had to replace all of them. That was all my money that I made from mowing yards. I'm very proud of myself, okay? The box said eight years or older. I finished that thing in a weekend. That must make me a genius. I mean, I just felt like this was, I said, I am somebody special here. Let's go to the next slide, please. Now, let's think about our early options here, European kits. I remember we had uh, all the hobby ships populated with European plastic injection molding kits a lot of cases I, uh, a lot of cases they can actually be modified of course I, uh, to have american practice they have certain little things that, and of course windows are often something that uh, um, are european uh, you know they hinge out different ways than ours do and of course with this of course this is this is box art from a kibri kit that was online but i mean it's kind of like the 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 roof is what's the kind of the thing that's kind of gimpy about this next slide please now, these were something fun. When I went to Lou Cook's Hobby Shop, I can remember, these were things like eight or nine bucks, okay? That was more money than I knew existed. <laughs> I mean, he even had, he even had uh, Scale Structures Limited stuff, which, okay, I could not, that was up in the stratosphere. These were, Campbell produced a number of Old West-style kits. And uh, the woman who, uh, uh, yes, woman, the woman who actually assembled these things did just a fabulous job with the uh, uh, and of course Campbell did have these displays for a number of years. It's my understanding the company is up for sale again. If uh, you're interested in Campbell, they wound up it was getting to the uh, people tend to age out with these sorts of things uh, from time to time and uh, don't have children who want to take over. But these were, I think her name was Sherry Collins. That's the name that I that sticks in my mind. But she did a fabulous job, but she was just very, very discreet with the way she weathered things. Now, the problem is a lot of people are intimidated by the box of sticks kit. With me, it's just the stuff you normally buy at the hobby shop, but it's already in the box. Now, in some cases, you replace it with better wood. Then, of course, I'm one of these weirdos. When I get a Campbell kit, I like to smell of that sugar pine. I actually will. The shows I'm weird. I like opening up the box and smelling that kind of odor of the sugar pine. And I'm thinking this is kind of good here and probably shows that I'm kind of weird or have something something not exactly wired up correctly in my brain here. Next slide, please. 
Now, here's another little fun here. This is actually, from what I understand, a real structure that was on the Gulf Mobile in Ohio. Now, forgive C.C. Crow for using a uh, um, uh, Illinois Central E6. And this is not washed out. When Lifelike did those things, they used a much, much, much lighter orange than uh, they really should have used. But this is a hydrocal kit. Now, it's my understanding that C.C. Crow, about a year ago, uh, moved from Spokane to elsewhere. He said, I just can't take this city anymore. I don't know if C.C. Crow is building that things anymore. These are hydro, yes. But it's still doing it. Good. Because these, I don't know if y'all have ever played around with this stuff. Uh, my dad was a dentist. We all, I had a free uh, HydroCal stash. And I had so much fun with HydroCal. I'd actually do things like I would try and, I mean, you got to understand it's like something a 12-year-old would do. I mean, they weren't exactly the scale because I didn't know what scale things were. But HydroCal is actually a fun medium to play with. You can stain it. You can do all sorts of interesting things. But I'm glad to hear CC Crow is back. You've got to be doing things again. Uh, last I heard, some of the, uh, uh, the silicone molds for making these HydroCal castings had become kind of long in tooth, and they were going to have to be redone and everything like that. Let's go to the next slide here. Now here's another one. You all remember these things? These were some cool kits. Yes. And uh, are there any on the are there any of these uh, uh, these kits on the uh, 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 layout here? No, sir. I remember the Swift meat packing plant that was always a fun one. The Purina uh, um, was another. These were, of course, a lot of people got turned off by these things. Of course, my brother and I we wound up getting a, one of the kits that was made out of metal and tried putting it together with epoxy. It's still in a box at my parents. I got to figure out a way to, now that I understand how to use a soldering iron, iron it's going to go a lot better. Next slide, please. Now, again, we talk about the kind of crude kits like what we had with the HM mini kits. They were kind of crude. They were plastic. I mean, they were molded in realistic colors. And of course, for me, finding out rattle cans, you could spray paint this stuff and make it look so much better. That was like a whole nother world that we could get into. But some of the newer kits are excellent. I somehow picked up two depots. Of course, this is the, the Walther's uh, Santa Fe Depot. They also have another one that they're saying is part of their, you know, mission style station. A um, friend of mine who was an architect said, don't you dare use mission. That's arts and crafts. That's craftsmen that don't ever use that term. It's Spanish colonial. And then I found out a few years ago that anything colonial is considered to be uh, offensive now, so you can't use it. In fact, I'm not kidding you. There is a paint that for years was called cl uh, colonial yellow that was used by both the MOP and the Southern Pacific on railroad structures, and it has since been rebranded as butternut because they were told the term colonial was offensive. And I'm thinking, okay, it was colonial because it kind of tied in with the 13 colonies, so I don't get it. But... Uh, but again, uh, I was wondering who that white-haired guy was over there, but anyway. But it's kind of some interesting stuff you can get now. The Walther's kits of today that are much, 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 much better than what we had in, in past in, uh, years before. Now, the Santa Fe Station, I mean, it's just a standard Santa Fe design with the, as this architect friend of mine said, with certain design elements that you just know are going to be Santa Fe, okay? Now, speaking of design elements, we can look at a fast food place and say, yes, that used to be a McDonald's. Yeah, that used to be a Burger King. That was my favorite. That used to be a, uh, uh, that used to be a, uh, uh, an old Pizza Hut. What's that? Yeah, Whataburger. There we go. But uh, again, uh, you can rebrand it, but you can still say, yeah, this used to be a, this particular place used to be a Pizza Hut. So we all know what design elements are. Now, one of the jokes that I heard, and I got this at an NMRA meeting, is if you got all the Ravel HM Tyco freight, freight stations and you get them end to end, it will circle the equator three times. And the advantage to that is the fact that you can do it in bulk. You can actually get the price down. Now, one of my gripes that I have about the hobby now is we don't seem to be bringing the youth in more or we're making things where it's hard for the youth to afford to get things in it. It saddened me, saddens me a good bit uh, because... Uh, you know, the thing is, I remember the, the, the Atherton blue boxes, which were so much fun. You know, 
four by eight sheet of plywood was fun operating all of this. But one of the things you can make your railroad your own is to use limited run kits of unique prototypes. That's where laser kits, things like CC Crow, that's where 3D printing comes in, okay? You're not going to see exactly the same structure in your layout. Now, most of us in here, we're going to do some modifications to the structure somewhat to where mine looks a little bit different than yours, okay? You want to extend it. You want to put a new roof on it. You want to make it where, oops, that's the so-and-so kit. Next slide, please. Now, this is another one of the classic kits, and uh, this probably also came from a Model Railroader article. Now, I think all of us have probably had this, and I got that off the old Model Kits uh, uh, website. And uh, a friend of mine back when I was living in Shreveport said, this really bothers me because when you look at that AHM freight station kit, he said, it looks like half of the depot. <laughs> and I looked at it again. Yeah, it looks like it was actually... They cut down the other half of the depot, which is something I saw the mop do uh, with a lot of the stations in Central Texas. You know, we're going to take the freight station, and we're going to make the freight station our depot and get rid of uh, of the uh, uh, the beautiful pasture uh, portion of this. I keep thinking of the Bryan, Texas station, which people think, well, that's our old station. No, they took out the pasture end of it when they remodeled it, uh, trying to discourage people from getting on pasture trains. So next slide, please. So let's talk about laser cut wood, 3D printed and resin kits. Now, most of us in here, uh, we had that little, we had a, 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 a depot uh, uh, um, building exercise we did. Dwayne, when was that? Was that 2016 or something? Was it that long? Somewhere back about that day, yeah. Yeah, which that was a fun thing to do. And people were thinking, oh my gosh, you know, Where'd you get those kits? Well, this gentleman back there did that, okay? Yeah, he he has a, uh, what kind of laser? Uh, uh, universal. Okay. I mean, look at the, look at the quality on that. I've still got the O scale. We sold the, 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 the two HO loading docks this, uh, this morning. Look at the quality on that. You've even got little holes in it to where you can put a uh, 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 nut bolt washer castings in there because in reality they'd have that thing on the side then they have a, a turnbuckle in the middle to try and you know keep that thing from falling down and mine turned out great I wound up taking home and staining it and surprised and the cats haven't destroyed it yet I don't know how that's happening anybody looking for a cat by the oh never mind anyway but this is kind of where we're going now now the thing is when you have a plastic kit Eventually, those molds wear out. Of course, I was getting a, uh, for grins, I actually picked up one of the kits I kind of destroyed with the uh, tube glue. Y'all remember the tube glue? Oh, my gosh, okay. Who in here has, who in here lost half of your brain cells from the tube glue? <laughs> I mean, good Lord, okay. My mom came in. I'm going to come in here, and you're going to be up here flying along the ceiling with that stuff. But, uh, and then, of course, then they came up with additive to keep you from snorting it. Anyway, but be that as it may, uh, flash dust tend to, you know, those, those molds will wear out over time. If they have indeed done enough of those uh, HM mini kits, Ravel freight stations to where it can circle the globe five times, yeah, those molds are, those molds are probably getting very, very long in tooth. These things, specifically laser cut wood, each one is a new, is an entity of its own. It's a standalone. That mold did not wear out. And you can wind up getting you can wind up getting these things and uh, uh, get them in just about any scale. Okay, it was not that pr big of a problem to change the scale on the artwork. Dwayne, what computer program did you do your artwork in? Yeah, I did a lot of the artwork for, I don't know if any of you old enough to remember Oddballs to Cows. Um, how did he get that name? Never mind, but <laughs> bad joke there. But I did a lot of the artwork for him on Corel Draw, and we'd send it back and forth with, that's really a very, very, that's from the people that give you word perfect, so that's a very, very good uh, 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 software program. But let's see if we can get the next slide. Sorry. Oh, we're fine, Okay. <laughs> Crashing, so well, fixing it as it goes. anyway, this is a laser cut wood kit, and uh, 
this was by American Model Builders that Sean Heitzman, that was his company. He passed away a couple of years ago, which kind of hit me like a ton of bricks. But this is a coastline Southern Pacific station. Now, talking about design elements, if you're out in the country and you see a depot on a farm, uses a pointer here, and you see um, you see these little boards that are um, from the windows that are that are vertical and going down under the windows. Chances are it was the Southern Pacific Company Depot. Okay, now how is this unlike the stations we have in Texas? You usually, had three three instead of three windows in the bay, you'd have two, and you'd almost have a dormer over it. And I was talking with John Heitzman. I said, you know, it is very. He said. The actual sizes of the structure are pretty much standard SP design. He said, you know, we could actually design it to where you've got a, a vent in the end, unique for the Texas and what the, the, I guess the Atlantic lines, and redo the bay window, and we'd have another kit here. And he talked about that, but it never got around to it. Next slide, please. Let's hope it doesn't crash here. You can do small runs of these things. Now, this is Huntington, Texas. And of course, this is, let me get the pointer to work here. It's kind of not showing up on the background here, but you look at the dormer over the bay window. That's kind of what we used to see all over Texas. And it uh, looks like the end has been painted. We can't see these uh, vertical boards that are flanking the windows on the end, but that's typical of a Southern Pacific station. Different bay than the Gulf Coast, than the coastlines did. Let's go to the next slide if we, Jim, yes. <clears throat> You actually have an extension down underneath. Um, instead of on um, Southern Pacific stations, you would actually have a board that extended down there, which had the net effect to make the building look a lot taller. Yeah, Let's back up to the slide before. Yeah, talk about trim on the, uh, trim on the window. Yeah, there's trim. Yeah, it shows up in here as well. There's trim uh, on the windows going vertical like that, which actually kind of it really kind of a neat thing, and that's unique to, to Southern Pacific. And yeah, they love doing that. And you can go out. I remember, I remember going out in the country and going to Frankston, Texas, and said, oh, my gosh, that's from the Southern Pacific uh, line that is through there. You don't see that on the Santa Fe. That's, I love this station here. I do not. That's from American Model Builders. I don't have it, okay, because didn't have a place for it. But this is one of those things that just you know, kept going, getting longer and longer and longer like that. Now, how you spot a Santa Fe station is they have an unusual way that they do the, uh, the bay window with a uh, uh, dormer over the roof there. And uh, that's that little, yeah, there we go. And that's typical of, of what we saw in the Santa Fe. And uh, I can remember seeing things this long and rambling in places like Oklahoma. Now, let's look at the next slide here. So American model builders, so many people are requesting, I just want the bay window, that they did a Santa Fe bay window. I guess you can put it on anybody's design you want to. That's a standalone kit, which is, that's kind of a Santa Fe uh, uh, design element. Let's go to the next slide here. Now, I think all of us have had the Atlas tool shed, plastic. This is ANLW lines. That's a Southern Pacific version of a tool shed over there. Now that's not been painted, okay? You can get some, you can you can paint that, and uh, I remember the kits would say molded in prototypical colors. Of course, then you've got the checker players out there, and I think all of us have kind of had that. That has been packaged in so many Atlas kits. You know, if you got the lumber yard, that's also packaged in there. But I've had friends that have actually taken these things and had a lot of fun with those. Let's go to the next slide. Through. Okay, we're gonna. Just looking at things. Now, again, Dwayne was talking about notching and tabbing and things like that. That's to keep goofballs from me from assembling things wrong. All right, let's look over here. You see, I put the sides. I did that this morning, uh, last night, just to show you the goofy stuff I would do, okay? There's the sidewall of the sidewall, okay? Don't put the sidewalls there. They need to go inside. That's just a piece of, that's just something I kind of threw together uh, over there. Laser kits are not, so don't misglue the sides to the ends. I don't know. Dwayne, have you ever judged something and seen people who do that? Oh, that's, that's a very common practice. In fact, I just did a play Tuesday night for the Narragage Monthly Zoom meeting. Uh, and that's one of the things that I've pointed out is that a fairly common mistake that people make is they put the sides on the end and they don't put the sides on the ends. And that's a very common mistake. 
time you've got a wall with peak in it, um, the side walls need to be moved to the back side of that peak wall because what ends up happening is the thickness of that wall creates a bump out. So when you put your roof deck on, you've now got a gap down here that you've got to hide with some trim otherwise. So there are peop other people don't like me who have done this. Oh yeah. Oh, I'm I'm really feeling good. I mean, I assembled yeah. that. I assembled that plastic kit. It took me less than eight years yeah. to do it. Yeah, I see it in the contest room all the time. It makes it that far. Yeah. Okay. okay. I thought it was just me that would do that. There, oh. there is a there is a very well known YouTuber that does it on almost every one of his builds. I'm throwing things at my screen every time he does it. Okay. Well, I'm glad to find out that I, I'm glad to find out that. Uh, uh, there are other knuckle draggers, and of course, luckily, I usually spot that. <laughs> I think, oh man, did I just do that? Yes. What was I thinking? I was thinking I probably shouldn't have had the third beer, but anyway. Yeah. <laughs> or yelling at the screen where the Cowboys are playing. Not that any of us will be yelling at the screen tomorrow. Let's go to the next slide, please. Now, here's something I like to do with laser kits. Uh, you can actually get, this is done by Charlie Duckworth, who's one of my friends. This is from Lake Junction. Google Charlie Duckworth sometime. You'll probably see some World War I modeling. He's exquisite. And he had the idea, this is a kit uh, uh, by Bill Haas. Used to be with American Model Builders, Lake Junction models. And those windows are, are in place like that, but something that's really cool that you can do, you can have certain windows that are open up. Back in the days before AC, that's what we had there. But this is one of his, one of uh, uh, Bill Haas's kits. I do have that at the house. I've not assembled it yet. I said, okay, I can assemble it. But when I uh, when I was going to move, it would have fallen apart. I was going to actually had a bunch of stuff. I was on a building bench when I was living um, outside of Hearst Euless Bedford. Next slide, please. Okay, mind the gap. Okay, another dumb thing that I've done here. Oh my gosh, now this actually was not done, this is one I did. I pulled this thing out of the box, and I said, okay, what have I done here? Okay, you got these boards that are supposed to come together. I said, I didn't do this, why did this, well, it turns out you get expansion and contraction. These things, they have a peel and stick adhesive on them. And you look over there, I mean, why did I have this gap on here? I mean, Dwayne, if you need a vomit bag, I can get you a vomit bag here. But again, I pulled this thing, and I was. This is what I was. I said, okay, I'm going to show them my ones with the warts on them. Okay, let's see. I've lost one of the steps down here, which may be actually prototypical. But look at that gap. Okay, I mean that's like you. That, that's like. I mean, you just don't see that in nature. Okay, but this is an American model builders uh, kit that I was looking over some stuff. I wanted to build them. I wanted to get a. Uh, uh, started working in a module of the standards that we have in the, the Denton group here. But the trim pieces will often start coming apart. They'll do that all the time, okay? Now, why did this happen? I built this when I was living in College Station. This stayed on my desk. Very proud of it. That's a moist environment. You're Houston, okay, for all practical purposes. Then I moved to Fort Worth. It was okay. Then I moved up to the Denton area, even drier. Those things pull apart. So what I'd have to do before this thing shows up uh, in front of everybody. I'm going to have to uh, pull those trim pieces off and reapply them probably with a real cement now. But anyway, you know, mind the gap. I looked over that and I said, oh man, I can't believe that just happened. Next slide, please. Yeah, so again, that's why we, that's why real adhesive were invented. Now, this is the thing that uh, we were talking, I was talking with uh, uh, Jim and Chuck this morning about uh, 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 Micromark. I mean, it's kind of like, we'll sit over there and get the, like all of us, they get it, by the way, they sell the um, addresses to Micromark. That's why we got our catalogs from them. But I can just sit over there and drool over the um, neat tools and you know different things you can buy. This is something that I'm always using, which is a, the tool, I think it's a tool maker's angle. I may be calling it by the wrong term here. But if you're putting together kits that are either resin or, or uh, uh, laser wood, you're gonna have to go with it. You usually don't have that problem with the plastic kits. Next slide, please. Y'all remember these things? You see them at, at uh, shows sometimes. That's Magnuson Models. That's, uh, that was actually done in a Alumalite resin. This is the old Miners Union Hall. Uh, this is one I got a picture off online. I was looking for mine that I actually built when I was a kid. 
which surprisingly turned out okay here. I've actually seen 3D printed interiors for these things. I've seen window kits. Look at those big windows. That just screams for let's go ahead and let's get a uh, uh, do an interior for it. But one of the problems with this kind of an application is this was in the early days. I think the the couple who were Magnuson models, they sold everything to Walters, and then they became design preservation models, which was, I believe, plastic, and then they sold those to Woodland Scenics. But these were some early kits here. Now, I expect to have bubbles uh, in this casting. People, It wasn't until later that they found out that if you book, hook up a vacuum and pour it, it will work a lot better. Next slide, please. So Walters bought them out. This is Wang Lee's department store, and this one did not have nearly the amount of bubbles that the other did. Eventually, these silicone mold, uh, uh, rubber molds will wear out, even though they're better resins than what we ever used before here. So that's kind of, but these are, they do have a lot of imperfections. I mean, I like when I want to kind of relax. A lot of cases, just building structures is a lot of fun. Uh, I'm looking forward to actually being able to work on a module and do some scenery. That's even more relaxing. Next slide, please. Now it's for 3D printing, okay? Now again, you don't have the flash to clean off of a plastic model. You don't have uh, uh, you don't have to worry about uh, this thing didn't pull out of the mold correctly. If you pick up one of the uh, resin kits at a uh, at a show. See if you can open it up. You may have uh, places where it uh, shrinked somewhat. 3D printing, I mean, every these different multimedia kits are pluses and minuses to everything. You're not using a mold with this. Those molds are never going to wear out, okay? Each one is a unique world unto itself. You can do them in various scales. Eric, what all, what all scales can you do your stuff in? Yeah, you'll have to get a different kind of of uh, of, uh, of uh, printer probably for that. But you can do very small runs. Now, I like the fact that you actually have your um, uh, kits over in Arby Spragan's place, which I've I've actually gotten these at several of these things. And of course, you look at some of his kits if you get a, get a chance. They're really quite good. Next slide, please. Now, this is from Jimmy Pitts of JP3D Models. This is a Missouri Pacific Line station in Downs, Kansas. He was at the NMRA National. Everybody kept asking him, he said, that's not HO, that's S. Guess what, folks? Most of the, most of the structures we got are selectively compressed. It's like the movie set in Old Town Tucson that they use. In all, that's, you know, three quarters the size of the real size. I mean, we had things like 12 foot and 14 foot ceilings everywhere. Jimmy Pitts also had, he's got a laser, which you can really do big stuff. From what I understand, I talked to him a few uh, uh, um, weeks ago, and he was doing a kit for a guy, which is a full size um, um, concrete uh, grain elevator. And it takes forever to print, forever to fill up, to, to uh, get it to print. And he had some of those at, uh, at the NMRE National, and people said, is that O scale? No, it's HO. We really, you know, it's really good to use those as, you know, if you're modeling something. Now, this will suit itself to that kind of an application. You can use the buildings as a view block. You don't have space for a mountain. You got grain elevators. But this is something people, he has to tell people, this is HO, this is HO, and people argue with him. No, it's S scale possibly smaller O scale. This is a large structure. Next slide, please. Now, this is a kit of a cafe in Hearn, Texas. Now, I did go ahead and shot this. I was actually doing some work on it. I was trying to do some details on it and replace windows and things like that this last week, and it got to be a, uh, a mess at the university that I work with, you know, changing classes around, and closing sections, adding new sections and everything. You can actually get these resin kits and do a lot of interesting things with them. Don't think they just have to put, you know, don't think, don't let these, these, uh, these 3D kits that you get, don't necessarily think of them as being a, uh, uh, you know, you just build it and set it on the layout. There is so much you can do with them. Uh, laser art, which is branch, which, you know, branch line trains, you can actually get their uh, already put together windows and Put, they will actually fit the openings for the windows in Eric's kits, okay? 
Yeah, we're having technical uh, technical uh, issues here. So again, I painted the front of that with gray, uh, so it would be easier to work on. And of course, this is another thing just screams get me an interior. And a lot of you know, I'm going to be adding open win uh, open windows because people say, "Oh my gosh, look at that, look at that." I mean, that's kind of the way it was. They didn't, you know, air conditioning was not that common uh, a couple of generations ago. You open the windows and you have ceiling fans. These wide windows cry out for an interior. Now, this was a cafe down in Hearn, Texas. I don't know if anybody in here did time at Texas A&M. Hi there, but anyway. But, uh, um, you know, Hearn actually had their uh, uh, railroad station at the junction. They had some interesting structures downtown. What you can do, this gets really basic, has the, everything in place. I actually was carving out the windows on this thing. Uh, those big windows got to have an interior. There's a door to the side over here. Something I've actually thought about doing is actually, of course, you can also you can also do some things with the with the door as well. But you may have actually had a staircase going up. I've been to a lot of these little small towns, and uh, you'll actually have a lodge building upstairs, and they'll rent the lower half. I think I, you know you also can do a drugstore, all sorts of interesting things. But if you look at the trim on that, I felt like this really captured the uh, the look of the prototype. Well, I mean, look at the different layers on that. How how long does it take you to to, to uh, print one of these? Uh, that particular building is about thirty six hours to four thousand. Y'all hear that? Thirty six hours. Okay. So that's kind of where we're headed now. We've got new modalities, new ways of putting things together that we never even had before. And of course, it's not going to, you know, what I plan on probably doing is probably having turnbuckles going down to the awning. Uh, that's something I saw in a lot of, a lot of country towns like that. That virtually screams out, you got to have an interior with that. Well, there are, those are available. You can find all sorts of 3D printed interiors. Look at the sides walls on there. That just screams out, put a sign on me, okay? Let's go to the next slide here. This will not crash here. I got online and was looking at some slides here. I mean, what are some old products that you don't see anymore? Royal Crown Cola. Yeah, the ancient Egyptians, the only way they were able to build those pyramids was they all had Royal Crown Cola. <laughs> you know, it didn't matter that they wouldn't get the, the, the that they uh, wouldn't give the children of Israel straw to mix in with the bricks. They just give them Royal Crown Cola. And they, you know, anyway. But it's interesting, but I looked at that sign and I said, that would be perfect. Now, here's another little product here. Now, I originally am from Louisiana, which you probably figured out with some of my bad diction here. But there was a product that was sold all over Louisiana called Hattacall. Happy Days Company had Senator LeBlanc. They did analysis. Uh, the Food and Drug Administration found it was 85% alcohol. That's the reason people felt a lot better, okay? <laughs> All these people, I mean, you know, you belong to a religious denomination that says you can't have alcohol. You can have alcohol. It's medicine. But I was going to actually, I was trying to find someone with that type of, uh, of font online, but that was their typical logo. I've actually been to, been to places down in South Louisiana. Well, I'm going to start going back into that talk if I don't watch myself. Uh, with a alcohol sign, all kind of frayed and kind of going away here. But the sides on those structures, that just screams, get me a sign. You can actually have an old structure, an old sign for something like, what's a product that hasn't been produced since maybe the 20s? Nabisco, you need a biscuit, okay? Then weather that. They'll put a no sign over the top of that. I really want to do that Texas and Pacific sign that's on, that was there in Deep Ellum. I don't know if some putts has not uh, painted over it yet, but I wouldn't put it past them. But some of the signs for... Cola manufacturers are just out of this world here, okay? I'm surprised that Microscale has not done uh, a sheet of, of, of cola signs. And it's another little thing that happens is you go in different parts of the country, you may have certain colas that aren't really found anywhere else. I'm sure at one time Dr. Pepper was just considered to be unique to Texas and then it spread all over the place. But I can remember as a kid going out and, and getting bottles out of the front yard that you think I grew up poor as a uh, as uh, Job's turkey, but I'd go out and get the wagon and pick up the bottles, and we take them down. We get something like a a nickel for a bottle or something like that. Big Chief Cola, all these kind of strange 
brands. I had a friend that was showing me Panola Cola Manufacturing Company uh, bottles. But these were kind of unique colas to different kinds of areas. Let's, I think this is my last slide here. Okay, maybe upstairs was a lodge. All these little small towns were going to have lodges. You would belong to a lodge. The reason you didn't belong to lodges. Now, by the way, just before we get any further along, who got into the NMRA so that you could plot world domination? Anybody in here? Okay. All right. Just want to find out that y'all are doing, you know, it's like real pinky in the brain stuff. You know, what are we plotting? World domination. But again, uh, most of the lodges in here are kind of um, um, trying to make sure that widows and orphans are all taken care of. But you go to these little small towns, you see BPOE, that's the Elks Lodge, okay? F and A M, okay? That's the Freemasons, okay? Then there's the Odd Fellows. Uh, I had an uncle who's buried out in San Angelo who uh, we all knew he was an Odd Fellow until we found out he was buried in the Odd Fellows section of the cemetery. But you see these signs all over the place, and of course these were uh, a lot of cases you'd have a structure like that. Upstairs was the lodge, downstairs they always had. That might be a good idea for a model train club. You own the building and you rent out the the ground store and your club is upstairs like that. But another thing about these signs over here is, I don't know if anybody other than me does this, but if I am at a place that has some plastic cutlery that's really kind of a strange shape, I'll say, man, I'm going to save this. Uh, some of the junk you see in my car, maybe some of that, some of it's just junk I threw down on the floorboard. Yes, sir. Uh-huh. That's not too surprising, but that's, I mean, you go through all these small towns, I mean, yeah, there was no real, uh, people always worried about your widows, your orphans, yeah. all these things. That was basically, and of course, I knew of one, I was talking to a friend of mine who, uh, her great-grandfather was a master mason and had a full Masonic Rites funeral. And, you know, the Masons kind of took over and did all these sorts of things, they were all very, very elaborate. And she, you know, was too young to remember anything about it, but it was just kind of, it was kind of a, it was a, it was a big, 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 big deal. And, uh, uh, again, usually these small towns are going to have different lodges. Um, you know, it's kind of like Sons of Herman. That's another one you have here in Texas, okay? Uh, most people think Sons of Herman, uh, think about the one in Dallas and, Oh, that's a music venue, okay? Yeah, believe it or not, there have been things, you know, recorded over in the Sons of Herman Hall in Dallas. So those are just some things to think about. So again, in closing, um, I apologize for the fact that this was kind of a, 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 a makeup or a backup a talk that I had kind of canned. But a lot of the stuff we have now, we're in kind of a new era here with modeling. You can do the laser kits. I mean, C.C. Crow is going to start making stuff again. I'm kind of excited about that. But uh, again, you. But again, some of the 3D printed. Uh, I mean, we're in a whole other area. It's probably, Eric, you're probably going to get to the point where if you look at, say, the Santa Fe Depot in Fort Worth, you can actually cast that in both the red and the off-white with your current laser. It'd probably be about $400 of a kit, but... Be that as it may, just take it out, dull coat the top of it, and you know, then you'll actually be able to get you can put a little bit of stuff from mortar in with the uh, uh, between the bricks, and your bricks actually, from what I found, they're very you know you can get that. Uh, I like using the Tamiya uh, panel line stuff, and it'll actually go into those grooves and then by capillary action, you know, tremendously well here. So what all have y'all been? Y'all had what experiences have y'all had with these kind of multimedia style kits? What works? What doesn't work? What do y'all like? What do you do? Yes, sir. We've had our laser for about use the mic. Fourteen years now, and uh, let me grab this here. Yes. We've had our laser for thirteen or fourteen years now, and the one thing I've found that's really nice about it is I can do up a building for whatever scale I need. Uh, so I've do I do some commission work from time to time. So I've sold some buildings for in everything from end to O. 
Um, I work with a, an S scale model railroad club. We do SN3. So I've done a lot of the stuff that I've done up. I'll do them in S, but then I'll shrink them down and make them something for HO so I can use it myself. And that, that's a huge advantage. And being able to go in and just, oh, I need a set of stairs. Okay, well, what's your rise over run? You go, you draw it up real quick, you go print it, and you've got a set of stairs that fits what you need. Um, it's, as you mentioned before, we have a lot of our buildings tend to be selectively compressed. And a lot of that is because we have limited space on our layouts. We tend to have a lot of room front to back, uh, not, not a lot of room front to back or up to down, but we've got a lot of room side to side. So you tend to see a lot of buildings that are laid out with that kind of orientation, but if you've got a building that they're doing and that you're trying to get a lot of depth out of it, they'll compress that down so they're not eating up quite so much space because most of us don't have much more than a foot, foot and a half to put our trains into as far as you know, front to back depth goes. Um, but with the new printing and the new things that are coming out, they're, they're just leaps and bounds better than the old ones. I mean, it's like you mentioned some of those kits, the molds are shot and they've been shot forever. I mean, you look at some of the metal castings that uh, Woodland Scenics is doing right now. Those were really neat buildings 35 or 40 years ago when those molds were new, but now the, the details kind of getting faded on them because the molds are shot. Uh, there's a ton of flash on them. They're hard to clean up and all that. So it's, it is one of those things, and it's costly to have those molds made, and it's one of the reasons why in a lot of kits you don't see the same building available in all the various scales because for me, if I can get it to you off the laser, I can do it in whatever scale you want. You want to do it in TT? Great. You tell me, Dwayne, I like that building, but I want it about three quarters of the size, and then I want that building that you do at about half its size because mm -hmm. I want to force the perspective going down the block. I can do that for you. The problem that a kid companies have, though, is, is fine scale miniatures kind of set the bar on it, and you, they expect you to open a box up, and there will be five pounds worth of metal castings in it. Yeah. And you can't make molds in all the various scales for that stuff and recoup those costs. So they landlock themselves into one scale, maybe two if you're really lucky. Uh, but for what I'm doing, if you want it in whatever scale you want, I can do it, you know, even if you want something customized. What is the, uh, how much time does it generally take you to do the artwork uh, uh, in Corel Draw for, say, well, like that uh, loading dock kit that you did? Um, I probably have two hours, maybe, in that loading dock kit, maybe. Okay. Um, I probably only had about an hour in it originally, and then I went back in and decided to go completely psychotic, and I put all the nail detail in the deck. And uh, so that, that's really where a lot of that came from, because every one of those, it's, it wasn't a case of nail down one board and then repeat it. Every one of those nail holes is individual. So if you stop and count the number of nail holes on your uh, on your decks on those things, yeah, you're going to realize just how strange my psychoses get. Um, uh, the little depot that we did a couple of years back, yeah, that one I've probably got, I've got more time in that one because when I drew it, I also drew interior parts for it too. Uh, so that one's probably four to six hours worth of work in it. But, I mean, you can really go down the rabbit hole with it. I mean... Um, Back at, back at our last convention down in, in uh, Round Rock, I took a uh, ON3 ON caboose, DNRGW style long caboose. And I framed it the way you would frame a real caboose. I made my own car siding for it and car sided it inside and out. I spent an entire day on the couch <coughs> one Sunday drawing all the interior parts. So the bunks up and down, the, the conductor's desk, the cupola steps, and I mean, all of that stuff. So, I mean, it really gets down to, you know, how, you know, what, you, what can you do? What, what, how far can your imagination go? Um, yeah, some of, the, some of the drawings are more involved. I mean, you look what Eric's doing with his because it's 3D. So he's got an extra level of his drawing that I don't have because mine's two-dimensional. So there's a lot of effort that goes into the drawings of these things. And most of the time, you know, you get a kit and they go together really well. They it's, really do. The, the real trick with any of them, and it's where my big problem is, is learning how to do the instructions. Because I'll be working on one, and I've been doing this for 46 years now. 40, no, 48 years now. Um, I'll do something and not even think about it, and I'll just say, well, go do this, and, and just for example, I'll say, well, do this and dry brush, da, 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 and then I go, oh, well, maybe they don't know what dry brushing is. So now one step becomes six and you try to figure out how far down do you need to, to bring the, the technical level of it down. Uh, and 
it really becomes a challenge. I mean, it really does. I mean, I've had a few people that have bought some kits that have called me up and said, um, I'm like, I got this kit. Yes, sir. Step 12. Yes, sir. What is this? <laughs> you don't know how to do that? No. Oh, okay. Sorry. I thought that was kind of common. All right, here's how you do that. And I'll walk them through it. Uh, so one of the things I'm actually considering doing, and again, learning yet more new software, I want to learn how to edit video. I'm planning on moving my instructions over to a video and then either uploading that to YouTube or giving you a DVD in the box with the kit. And then it becomes instructions on how to build it and clinics on how to weather it and paint it and assembly and all that. So it's, it becomes a big challenge. It really does. Okay. Yeah. And, yeah. <laughs> and, and that's why I was talking about load it to YouTube and let YouTube do the heavy lifting. Yes, sir. And you're going to be done in 3D? Uh, not for the software package that I use and not for something that I can cut on the laser because the laser is looking at everything at two dimensions. So I would, if I got a 3D drawing in, I would have to have something that could break that back apart and then lay it all flat and be able to uh, work through it at a two dimensional phase. Okay. Super. Yes. Uh, DXF, DWG, Illustrator, PDF. There's 10 or 12 different formats, and I do custom cutting. So if you guys have got something drawn you want to have cut, that's great. Now, something you mentioned under your design elements, one of the things you guys will notice in a lot of these depots, and, you know, and all of them do this, you'll notice that you go to town one, and the depot's got two windows here, and you go to the next town, and it's basically the same depot, but it's only got one window. And you go to the third town, and it's basically the same depot, but it's got two windows here, and now it's got one over there. Or it's a mirror image. That's one of my favorites. They, yeah, exactly. Railroads, as we've all discussed this before, and as I'm sure you all know, railroads are cheap. And what they'll do is they'll pay the architect once. <laughs> and they literally would put together kits of these depots. All right, we got town, you know, Smithville. All right, great. They would need which depot? They want the number four depot. So they would put it together on a car or a set of cars, wheel all the lumber in there, and they'd start putting it together. And the guy'd go, you know, I. I I like the view looking that way. Can we get an extra window on that side? Yeah, sure, no problem. We'll just have to take that one off and put it over here. And they would do it that way. So you see what looks like very similar depots all over the place. Now, this is an advantage for us because it means we can buy those kits and then customize them to move things around wherever we want them and make them individual to our railroad. So if you're doing the Santa Fe, but you're doing a fictitious branch of it, Buy those Santa Fe depots and then add an extra windows here and there. Makes make them great. Makes them your own. Okay. Another thing that I've seen happening is talk about design elements is there was a publication that um, um, they had railway cars and locomotives. There was another Simmons Boardsman publication on railroad structures. They would copy each other. I have a box of, box of sticks kit, Glorcraft for a CNO depot, which is a if you change some of the structure around a little bit, it's basically a depot that I remember as a child back in Louisiana that was on the Missouri Pacific. It's a mirror image of it, but I mean, I'm somewhat weird anyway. I do a lot of things backwards anyway, but I just replaced some of the lumber. And of course, already got the plans and it almost looks like somebody said, okay, somebody's really proud of this design. They had some blueprints there in this particular publication. We're gonna copy this because it's really good. So there is some, here's some uh, stealing of designs. They're not embarrassed over stealing designs. Very good. Jim, thank you very much. Let's give him a hand. If, if, you'd, like, if you'd like more information about Eric's business, it's scalemodelrr.com, okay, or talk to him after the meeting. Uh, we have 31, 39 folks here today. Um, I'd like to encourage you to stay and help 42. us. 42. Okay, Mike got here. Mike was 40, two more. Okay, we're up to 42. We average, he said we averaged about 50 last year, so hopefully we'll uh, have a few more next month. Please stop at the table and talk to Harold about an, a raffle ticket or to fill out your name on the thing before you leave. We'd also like to have some of you stay and help us with the, the layout that's being put together to be raffled off at next week's Plano Train Show. Speaking of the Plano Train Show, we still need volunteers. Um, if you're there, stop by. If not, or contact uh, Russell, gosh, my, I'm not having any luck today. And uh, last but not or not last but not least, we have the LSR convention coming up. Please plan to re register. And one last thing, please keep uh, Mike Mackey in your thoughts and prayers for a speedy recovery. So, thank you.
and have a good month. We'll see you back in February. Nice job, Tom. <laughs>